And with that, there we are. We're live, and you can see Dan Milner, first guy into the chat. How about that? Dan, the man. We're going to bring him on in just a second. Uh, I am here. Yeah. It sounds like we got a little feedback going on there, Dan. Maybe you want to turn that YouTube volume down. Otherwise, we're going we're gonna to keep hearing ourselves 30 uh, seconds later. With that. There we go. That, that better? Yeah, that's much better. All righty. Hey, listen, you guys. Tune in. I mean, tell us where you're tuning in from. There's Yvette and there's uh, Batarig. Love to see where you guys are and that you're joining us once again for the famous Dan Milner show. Um, we got a lot of new stuff going on here at AYP. We just finished our big course that we're actually going to launch today. And we got a notification last night as of uh, March 31st that we hit 10 million views. You guys have been spending way too much time looking at our stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry. Jared told us a funny joke about that. It's like, hey, but I love that you're looking at it and everybody else who's looking at it. I'm sure you probably didn't do all 10 million, you know, one or two people. So we've spread it out into the world. Okie dokie. Well, let's get the party started. I'm Mark Silber, author and educator in Carmel, California, and the show today is not brought to you by YouTube. Let's get that screen right. It is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo Lab. And uh, listen, you guys, you know how I feel about getting prints made. Do it. There's so many ways you can get prints from these guys. You can get them framed. They actually have really good framing options, and you can Go into their site. You get 15% off on them. You can get plain black frames or some of these other ones that they have with various different kinds of matting. It'll give you a preview so you can see what you're doing. Press printed products, anything from these accordion fold-out things to uh, press printed books and folders and all sorts of cool stuff, 30% off. 20% uh, off on wood prints. I've never made one of those, but you can check it out. 25% off on your first order. So listen, whatever you do, get prints made, right? I mean, get it out of your computer and onto the wall. That's the best place to show off your work. Okay, well, without further ado, we're going to bring on our guest. There he is, folks, live from his van. Yep. It's Van the Man, Dan. And Dan where are you? Where are you, Dan? I am in a driveway in Santa Fe. Just because, uh, is this your home driveway or is this just some random driveway? It is someone's home. It is not mine. It's my friend David's house. And David has high-speed internet. And where I live, we still do not have high-speed internet. Well, so, there you go. So you just drive your van around until you get it. I either go to the library or I go to two different friends' houses here who have high-speed internet. So yes, this is the these we're in the backwater here. We're in the wilds. We still um, the the fastest internet that we had at our house was 1.5 megabit. Whoa, we're back. We're back in. Uh, might as well be on a DSL router, you know, at that point. Yeah, might as well um, hand crank the thing. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of. Um, I was kind of surprised. I knew that it would be slow, but that was uh, even slower than I imagined. So yeah, I'm pirating Wi-Fi as we speak. Okay, well, good for you. So uh, hey, listen, somebody randomly came across my book in a local library. I think that's pretty cool, and yet that's where you found me. I love it. I love to see those books in the library. I love libraries, and our library is about to open back up again, which. How weird has it been to not be able to go to a library for a year, right? So, yeah, it's. Um, I go to the library all the time, but ours here still isn't open. You have to go to the front, and they, you know, everyone's masked up, and you exchange books and stuff. But yeah, the library to me is like one of the most amazing resources that has sort of been, sort of been skirted during the bit, you know, the the internet revolution for people to sort of thinking that they can get the same sort of thing. But the library to me is just such an incredible resource. It it's is. fun going there. That gets us into a whole different subject, which we'll touch upon in another show of books that you love, because that's always a great thing to dive into. But for today, we're going to discuss, and we were discussing this before the show, why you ought to have 
a simple set of equipment, whether it's one lens or one camera or at least simplify things. And there's some big pitfalls. What are those things, Dan? You were talking about your workshops and what happens when students show up and they're just looking, they're stuck in the back of their camera and menus instead of seeing what's going on in front of them. What, what is, what's the deal here? <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of odd. I mean, it makes sense in some ways because obviously what we were talking about before is there's so much more equipment now than there used to be. You yeah. know, there used to be where a, a brand would maybe come out with a new camera every four or five years from the Nikon F3 to the Nikon F4 to the Nikon F5. There were huge gaps of time in between. And none of those cameras had menus or anything. It was shutter speed and aperture. That was basically it. That was it. You know, the, the F3 had a removable prism and that kind of things. And the motor drive was faster than the prior generations, but that was pretty much it. After about five minutes, you're like, okay, I know how this works. And then you never thought about it again. So it's in some ways it makes a little bit of sense now because one, you have many more people making cameras and, and they're releasing a new camera every whatever, you know, six months or so. And it's easy to get sidetracked into thinking, Oh, this is, I better get the new one. I better get the new one. And then yeah. what happens go in the field and you're just floundering. And I've seen that with workshop students for years and years and years. I remember being in Peru and in the middle of a religious procession and looking at a student standing in the street, staring at the back of their camera. And I just remember thinking, man, this is, um, and my, my first little point I want to make here is the longer you do photography, especially with things like documentary photography, I'm not talking about product or studio or anything that you're controlling. I'm not talking about shooting old buildings. I'm not talking about shooting, you know, urban abstract landscapes that are all the rage. I'm talking about like people based documentary. What you start to begin to realize after you do this long enough is how rare the occasions are where everything comes together. You know, it may, it may happen once or twice a year where you're like, oh my God, everything here is right. And if you're floundering with something or trying to learn a new piece of equipment in the middle of that, it just makes it exponentially more difficult. And it's really interesting, Dan, that photographers of all different genres that became great generally focused on one setup. Like Richard Avedon, you know, he shot with an eight by 10. Boom, that was what he did. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Ansel Adams, he, he had a lot of different cameras, but he either shot with one of his big cameras, uh, like an 8x10, or his Hasselblad. But he knew that equipment inside and out. He knew exactly what it would do. He didn't have to fumble, fiddle. He knew what, e what each lens was going to do, the focal length. So you can then visualize it. But if, it, if that's changing all the time... Your, your variables just go up exponentially. And you're and like you said, you're going to miss the shot. Yeah. I mean, even, ch even subtle changes like changing a lens can make a re you know, that can take a long time to learn, even change changing a version of a lens going from, you know, if you have, if you're using a Leica rangefinder body and you go from using a F2 50 millimeter to an F 1.4, the, the size of that lens, the weight of the camera, the, 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 the sort of balance of what that camera is changes and you have to learn how to use that. You have to learn how it, it sounds crazy, but you have to learn how to hold it. You have to learn how to, the focus is different from the 50 to the one four in terms of how that lens barrel works. Yeah. So if you're, if you're changing all the time, then you've got that added layer of complexity, degree of difficulty that none of us need because it's photography is hard enough as it is uh, to do that. But you know, I have hundreds and hundreds of photo books and I don't know of a photo book that I have that has a bunch of different formats in the same book. Right. You know, right. that's not what publishers are looking for. They're looking for a cohesive body of work. So, you know, Sebastian Salgado shot like a, our cameras for decades, you know, with a 28, a 35, a 50. And I think he used a 90 occasionally, but he was primarily a 28, 35, 50 guy. And that's what he did for decade after decade after decade. He shot the same film for decade after decade. And that's why he's arguably the most important modern era of documentary photographers. He was able to amass massive amounts of content of, of work over decades and decades. You know, there is no one else quite like him. And to your point, you know, uh, you have photographers that that just commit to a certain look and feel and that's all they do. 
and that's and, that's really and, good. Yeah, and going back, by the way, I know we advertise this as six easy tips. You guys are going to have to keep track. We're just kind of rattling these things off. I don't I know. I just if, did the first. I, I only, I've only done one so far. Okay, cool. But even like going back to classical art, right? So, so Vermeer had a setup. He had the north facing window. He had the he had the canvas over there, and he figured out. Uh, how to get the blue pigment. Nobody since then has ever figured this out. That perfect blue pigment. But once he got all that stuff, he wasn't messing around, I'm sure. He had that set up and he used it over and over again. Do you think Picasso went out like when he was 75 years old and said, I, I need to buy new brushes, a new whole new brand. I'm going to change what I've been doing. Y you can bet that he used the same brushes for 50 years because every time you change you tweak something around like was there some big technological advance in brushes that would cause him to throw out everything and start over again no he knew what he could do with that and that's then he could focus on his art and not on the equipment yeah and picasso picasso was relentless he produced an incredible amount of work you know I, I was reading reading recently about his lifestyle and the and there was a book um, a book I read that broke down like hundreds of different artists and how they divided their day, what time they went to sleep, what time they got up, what food they ate, you know, huh. their party party rituals. And Picasso was just relentless, and he produced all the time. And I think whatever, if you're a painter or an illustrator, designer, photographer, and you are relentlessly working, the, anything that gets in the way of that work, whether it be um, socializing or you know your health or your equipment it just is it just becomes a, a bother that you don't want to have to to deal with you know for me i i have so little time to work on projects now that when i go in the field i can't have anything that is distracting to me i don't want to go into the field using a new like i was telling you earlier i'm teaching in albania in september and i was supposed to teach uh, in 2020 but we obviously postponed it but I went to Albania the first time in 2019 and I shot the whole trip with a 50, you know, a Fuji X-T2 and a 50. And since that time, I bought a Fuji X-T4 and a wide angle zoom lens because I'm using it for motion. And I bought a drone and I bought, you know, all this other stuff because of my job. But I'm going back in September of this year and I'm taking an X-T2 and a 50 because that's what I used last time and I, that's all I need. And I need to keep co cohesive with the work so that when I go back this year and I add to what I've already done, I'm adding to cohesively to the same story. If I was now suddenly going to use a whatever, 10 to 24 Fuji zoom and a different camera and yeah, new menus, it doesn't, it doesn't help. It doesn't work. And it doesn't, it actually holds me back instead of just using what I did before. I hear and, you. Uh, and it's nice. It's a relief. The second point I would make, yeah, and this is another perfect example, is that it's just nicer to carry less stuff. You know, if when when I'm teaching a workshop, we're pretty much on the move. M most of the time, we're on the move. We may spend two two and a half days in a location, and do some reviews, and you know, design books and magazines, and be around the same place, right? So people have a little bit of free time and they can choose what they want to do, you know, et cetera. And um, it's nice to moving around that much to not have to carry a lot of stuff. You're just carrying a simple, simple things and it makes it much more enjoyable. Yeah, right on. And yeah, because if you have a big bulky bag with a bunch of stuff in it that you don't need, it's, it's just gets in your way right another thing that gets in your way yeah it's you know when you're carrying a suitcase and you know for me i'll have a i have one camera bag which i never take in the field i just use it to trans transport stuff from location to location and then i have a little day pack a little backpack that i have you know water food uh rain gear that kind of stuff and then i have yeah. my little tiny suitcase my little away bag that has a battery pack in it for like recharging stuff it has my yoga mat it has my sort of workout stuff in my clothes and my, you know, and that's it. And it's this nice little setup where you basically have two bags. The day pack fits inside one of the bags, so I don't have to carry that extra. And, and that's it. And I have a pocket full of batteries and a camera with a 50. And then I'm just in the field. You know, that's all I have to do all day long is kind of go, I'm just looking for what I'm look, what I'm here to look for. Boom. And I, I that's think it's number sort two, of, right? I, yeah. And number three is that, 
this it's kind of tied into um, number number two, which is the days of of wandering around on the streets looking like a photographer with a bunch of cameras hanging off of you. Yeah. I don't know anybody who's doing that anymore. Yeah. Not not anybody who's like really I mean, even I know I know some of the best photojournalists in the world, and even they have changed their style. Where you know, you even have guys who are using nothing but a mobile phone. I'm not a huge fan of that work, but there's people doing that. But a lot of people have shifted away from from big SLR cameras, and they're all using mirrorless. And yeah. you know, you see a lot of Fujis, a lot of Sony's, a lot of Lumix out there now. Of people just saying, "Look, I don't, I can't afford to look like." Miss Joe photographer or, jo- or Joanna photographer anymore because the reception isn't very nice anymore. You know, it's a very different thing going in the field now with a camera than it was 20 years ago. And so, and that's a, that's a derivative of the internet and social media and people sort of assuming that what you're doing is going to end up on these channels immediately and that you're yeah. sort of profiting from people. And so they get suspicious and you show up looking like, you know, Joe or Joanna photographer. And they're like, what are you doing here? So it, it's nice when you're just working with a single camera and, and um, the reception is, is often much nicer. Boom. Big point there. Big, big point on that one for sure. Yeah. I mean, again, I can remember teaching workshops where, where, you know, people are walking around with two Canon SLRs, a short zoom, a long zoom, a fanny pack, you know, bags and, and, the, <laughs> and, you know, the people that you're photographing are like, what is this? Is this an invading army or, you know, what is this person doing? And oddly enough, those folks never really made great work. The people yeah. who made the best work were the ones who, who might have had far less training in photography, but they had a simple setup that they just, you know, wandered around and spent more time looking, more time talking to people and and got a little bit more intimate because they weren't so um, – I don't want to say offensive. It's it's just you know a little bit less full court press with equipment. Yeah, um, I remember in Peru one year, um, someone all they had was a point and shoot, and you know they initially they kind of felt bad because everybody else is running around with these big cameras, and this person was like, I kind of feel inadequate because all I have is this little point and shoot. And oddly enough, she made unbelievable work the whole time because she could walk right up on people with this point and shoot and nobody paid any attention to her at all. And these other people, you know, with like howitzers and stuff, these super (laughs) long lenses and everyone was like, Whoa, Whoa, what's going on here. And so, and I think like my camera is, is this big, Yeah, you know, it's, it's relatively small. This is, but even this today for a lot of people is like, Oh, there's a photographer here. If you have a camera like this, because everybody's got a phone obviously. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, the, I can't, this is about as big as I'll go now, a camera like that. And, um, now when I go back this year, the one difference is I have different responsibilities now outside of, you know, if I'm teaching last year, when I went to Albania, I was taking the workshop and this year I'm going back and I'm co-teaching the workshop. Right. So the relevance of my work has dropped significantly. So, because now I have to pay attention to everybody else and, and help them with making their magazines in real time as we go. So my, my priorities have shifted. And also, I'd like to make some films about actually being over there. Nice. So, so I might shoot motion and record sound and fly the drone and shoot stills as opposed to last year, which again Dude, is going to. That's dangerous. Gonna be, dangerously getting out of the Dan the Dan world here. I mean, I don't know drones with multiple cameras. Okay, we'll 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 kind of put up with that, but I'm not sure if you're pushing the envelope here too much. No, the envelope is gone. Because <laughs> number one, I'm teaching. Yeah. So, so if this is my work here, and this is the the work that I did last year, you know, I'm teaching. So boom, my work drops way down. Right. Then I have different responsibilities now because I'd like to sort of create something that shows what it's like to be there on a workshop like this, which means maybe recording sound, shooting some motion, yeah. the drone. So my work just continues to go like this. Well, we'll allow it because it's a whole different purpose. You're, you're, you're not. It's not about your, what you're coming away with. It's about what you're documenting with your students. Okay, totally different hat. I get it. Yeah, that's it. And so I already know that the work that I will make this year will not be as good as last year, and that's yeah. fine because yeah. I'm taking on a different responsibility. But there will be times where I will just go in the field with you know, my camera and actually try to make something decent. But 
those will be fewer and far between. Yeah. Okay. A case in point, by the way, uh, I interviewed Turu Kuamea, which he's on my channel, and and he shot with a toy toy cameras behind the scenes in war zones. And he uh -huh. did that because he didn't want it, like for many reasons, he didn't want to show up with an expensive DSLR. He didn't want to show that he's this big time photographer and have expensive equipment that could get damaged. But it also helped him avoid that being branded. Oh, here's this American photographer coming in. Toy cameras. So check that out. That might be the way to go in some cases, yeah. right? I used to use Holgas a lot in when I would do projects and I and Holgas if you don't advance the film all the way you can oh, do yeah. what I would want. you could you could call them imperfect panoramas with overlap and those were really fun they were low percentage but I remember you know traveling through Cambodia traveling through Bolivia doing projects with the with the Holgas uh, with those imperfect panoramas and yeah, it was great. And people just didn't take you seriously because you'd hand them this thing and they'd be yeah. like, this is an absolute piece of junk. This is a plastic, you know, camera. What are you doing? But the results from those negatives were, were fantastic. So yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I think even the low end cameras today, the lowest of low end, you know, in the line, if I shoot Fuji, if you take Fuji, for example, you know, they have these little tiny cameras now that have interchangeable lenses that is more than enough for 99% of the people walking the planet to use a camera like that. And they're affordable and small and worst case scenario, you drop it or you get robbed or whatever, you can just replace it. It's yeah. not, you know, giant, this giant thing. Um, oddly enough, I was going to say film cameras are the same way, but they've become so expensive again. Um, it's not, it's not quite the same way. I mean, I, I look at the film, the film cameras that I use that I've had that I bought for like nothing, they're now worth thousands of dollars and it just cracks me up that um and film i saw a roll of velvia the other day for on sale for 22 bucks oh man who can afford that and then processing and like, it yeah and, and and tri x for 12 bucks a roll and i was like it used to be like a dollar 35 a roll and you know we were like god this is expensive and now we buy it like, in bulk right remember those big bulk oh yeah things? 100 foot rolls yeah Yep, I have a, I still have a bulk bulk reloader somewhere. But, mine is um, yeah, gone. Mine is long pretty, gone. You'd roll your own. Things. People probably don't even know this. We would we would roll our own thirty five millimeter. You know, film. Uh, we you have a little container. You put it in there, and you you have to make sure there's no little grit, or else you got these scratches across. There's a little trick to it. Okay, Dan, yeah. what's what's number four? Yeah. Number four is a rehash of something we've already sort of touched on, which is about, um, and I can't stress this enough, and it's a question that I've received on YouTube uh, many, many, many times. Yeah. Is is cohesion. It's just, it's if you're going, and this is not for somebody who's walking around shooting random images. That There are no rules if you're doing that. If you're just doing random images or, you know, just scattered kind of stuff, then you can do whatever you want. You have a ton of freedom. But if you are trying to do projects, and I get a lot of questions specifically about um, how to do projects. And the number one thing is you've got to have cohesion in the work that you're presenting. It has to, you know, you can't have 47 different kinds of, of content because it's really difficult to make sense of that. I can only yeah. think of a few projects of people that I know who have done things like that. And even that, they're incredibly hard to sell because no one can quite figure out what they are. So, and that can be as simple as having too many lenses. You know, you're shooting a 24, a 35, a 50, an 85, a 135, a 70 to 200, a 100 to 400, and you're out there, you know, staring at this box of lenses or bag of lenses going, which one am I supposed to be using now? And then you get back and what you do is when you put those, when you start printing and you put your work out, you go, man, it's really hard to fit these puzzle pieces together because everything looks so different. Yeah. And that one person who's walking around with a fixed lens on a little camera, their work may or may not be good, but when they come back, they're, they're at least putting prints down that have a cohesion to them. That's really important. And, and this is not sexy. And this is why this can be such a hard sell to people. You know, if you if everybody's using one lens on a fixed camera or fixed lens on a camera, all these YouTube channels that talk about nothing but equipment, they go away, right? Yeah. Because no, nobody's going to be sitting there looking at unboxing films or 
talking about whatever latest, you know, widget is coming out because you're like, nope, I'm good. You know, I've got my five-year-old 50 millimeter and my five-year-old camera and I'm just going to keep gr grinding on this thing. It's not sexy, but it's, you know, but I think there, you know, if we broke this into two categories of, of people who talk about photography and then people who do photography. Yeah. And the people who talk about photography have tons of equipment and the people who do photography. I mean, I'll give you an example. I met a kid here in Santa Fe a couple of years ago. I went to a friend's house pre COVID went to a friend's house and they said, Hey, <clears throat> there's a, there's a young photographer coming in from Latin America. And if you're around, it would be fun for you guys to meet. And he showed up. I kid you not. He had a Fuji, uh, I want to say it was an X pro one and the eyelets on the camera were worn through. I've never seen that on any camera of any brand ever. He had used that camera and lens so much that the eyelets, the metal eyelets on the body wore through Amazing. And, had, and had cracks and he couldn't use a strap on the camera anymore. You know, and that kid, we did, we did not have the only conversation we had about equipment was, hey, can you help me contact someone at Fuji because I need these eyelets replaced? He wasn't even saying, can you contact someone at Fuji and get me an X Pro 2 or an X Pro 3? He was just saying, this camera's fine. I just want to get it fixed. <laughs> Amazing. That's, we a, that's about, a well used camera. Yeah, we just talked about the work, you know, the images and, and editing and sequencing and books and all that stuff, which is, again, you have the people, I think, that talk about this stuff and then yeah. there's the people that do it. And there's a very different conversation happening. And there's far more people in the category of talk than do. And I think historically that's always been the case. And, and probably it's, it's the case in everything. You know, if you're a four by yeah. four enthusiast, if you're a tennis player, if you're whatever, people are like, yep, yep, yep. All the time about like, you know, I would play tennis if I could get the, U, the new Yonix racket, but yeah. you know, I don't have the new Yonix. I still have the old Wilson racket and I got to get the Yonix. And so, and then you realize, you know what, you're probably never going to play tennis, even if you got the Yonix racket. It's a gear, but, yeah, gear fixation is very different than actually doing stuff. And this this channel is is about the guys who want to do things. That's why you guys are here, right? You want to make photographs. And, you want to create something. And I think the last the last two points are actually three ingredients rounded together. Let's hear them. Lay them on. Which is not which is not about once you've once you've figured out one two three four and why the benefits of those apply the last three things you want to talk about are the actual ingredients of the photographs that you're looking for. Okay. Which, which are light timing and composition. Yeah. That's it. If you're, if you're in the field and you are thinking about something other than light timing or composition, you know, unless you're talking about logistics of, I think I need to move myself, you know, into the next town. Yeah. But that is, that is really it. That is what, what you're doing in the field is you're looking for, number one is you're saying, okay, what is the light like? And can I work in this light or do I need to be doing something else until the light is where I, where I need it? Or can I find something that's, you know, open shade, slightly covered, backlit where I can work? And because a lot of times you're going to walk around and you're going to be in places at times and see things that you realize, even if I shoot this, the light sucks and I can't use it. Yeah. So light is the number one driving thing. And then if you're a doc photographer like me and you're shooting what I would call um, reality based photography, and I think that that was a coin, that was a phrase that was coined by actually someone who writes about photography in the art, in the art world. And his, his writings deal with the fact that the art world has never really had a, an appreciation for reality-based photography, that the art world has much more of an appreciation for staged work or conceptual work. So when they look at someone who's a documentary photographer, they do not understand the degree of difficulty and they don't give it the respect that it, that it deserves. And so timing is that second ingredient. And again, when you're look when you're wandering around looking for the kind of light that you need to work in 
the less equipment you're carrying, the better off and happier you're going to be because it's just physically easier to do. Then when the timing creeps into the conversation, the fact that you have a camera that you're incredibly familiar with, that second nature means that you can actually time images and get real moments. So the vast majority of imagery I see being promoted online today isn't real. It's fabricated, it's posed and staged and, or it's in inanimate objects, you know, it's old barns and old cars and things like that. And those are like low hanging fruit because they're not moving. Right. There's no timing. You know, I see all this stuff being promoted. I saw Kodak post a bunch of pictures on social media the other day that were just not good, you know, and they were static pictures of like, you know, stuff we've se- retread stuff we've seen 10,000 times that shows no real skill on the part of the photographer because there's no timing involved. Right. So the, it, to get, to get images, you know, the decisive moment style photographs, you can't fumble with your stuff. You have to just be boom, boom, boom. All the best images exist in like one or two frames total. Yeah. So that's the, and then the final part of that is your composition and you start to understand things like spacing which is the, <clears throat> the distance between elements in your frame, foreground, midground, background. And some people, you have to understand where your sweet spot for spacing is. Some people like street photography where, where they're right on top of other people and their spacing is very tight and very wide. My spacing is what I would call a middle distance spacing. And it works best with a 50 millimeter for me. 35 is too wide, 24 is way too wide, 85 is too tight. So I know for a fact when I'm wandering around and the light is right and I'm ready to make pictures that I have to be in a spacing that allows me to make the compositions I want. And so again, I'm not thinking about my camera gear because if I'm thinking about my camera gear, I can't think about my composition and the spacing because I'm thinking about something else that's distracting me. All I'm doing is I'm wandering around and that camera's in my hand all the time. It's not around my neck. It's not on my shoulder. It's in my hand because that timing is so critical and so brief that you have to be ready. And I'm just waiting and I'm watching and I'm waiting and I'm watching. And when I get into those areas where the spacing is right, my heartbeat goes up Mm. because I'm like, I'm like the light is right. I'm ready to shoot. The spacing is right. All I have to do is wait for the pieces to move where I need them to move. And, and here's the, another reason why you never see, a, a, or there's a lot less of this work being shown, is 90% of the time you're gonna fail. You know, you miss, the pieces don't move where you want them, or they move but there's something distracting, or, yeah. you miss, or you miss the timing and you're like, oh no, I missed the timing and I feel like an idiot and that haunts you for half a day. Yeah. And you're in the field going. And when you're shooting old buildings or random street pictures or inanimate objects, you got all day. You know, it just, it's just easy. You're wandering around and there's no sense of like real, you know, uh, there's no urgency and there's everything is it, nothing is that brief. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, some of the greatest photographs of all time have had that seconds to get to press the shutter, you know, Louis Pasteur's famous quote, chance favors the prepared mind. Ansel Adams said, chance favors the prepared photographer so this is the thing if you're familiar with your equipment you're prepared you're not thinking you don't want you don't want to have any thought about the camera that should just be an instinctive thing so all your attention is out there waiting for that moment the decisive moment as you said as our so, friend cartier brisson says i've been fortunate enough to work in the field uh, at times over the years around some like world-class famous reportage people magnum people uh and had and at times was able to spend days with them you know working on a similar project in the same area and then watching how they worked and they would do the same to me uh in fact at one point i was in um in europe working on a project and there was a magnum photographer there and i would i would shoot something or frame something and he would walk exactly where i was where i made that picture uh, and, and frame, he wouldn't shoot it. He would frame what I had shot and, and then sort of, we would make, we would nod to one another. And that was just a way of saying, I'm curious what you saw. And 
all of these people through the years that I've been around, they've all been one camera, one lens for the most part. They might have had a second body because if a, if something happens to your first camera and it breaks, you got to have a second camera. You can't you like, you know, not have functional equipment. But they were primarily shooting one camera and one lens. And they were just basically, you know, acknowledging that maybe you saw something they didn't. And that's what was intriguing to them. We did not sit around talking about camera equipment. We, it just didn't happen. You were talking about like, did you see that moment? Did you see that shaft of light? And if you stood, you know, three feet to the right, it was backlit. And, you know, that's the kind of conversation that photographers have who are the doers and not the, not the talkers kind of thing. And it's fascinating because photography is competitive. And, you know, some people get really competitive and they're, you know, they'll do that same thing, but they're kind of like, you know, they're not as polite about it. They're basically saying, yeah, you might have seen this, but, um, you know, what I saw is better kind of thing. And it's kind of fun. You know, you get you get to um, push each other to make to make better work. Um, but again, it's just it's just simplicity. I mean, that story that I was working on in Europe, I worked on it for four years. You know, that's four trips of flying from California to, um, you know, a, a hard to get to place in Europe. That's, you know, two days of travel and the logistics and all the movement in country. And again, you've got to be very comfortable and familiar with your equipment and, and simplify everything. I never went to that project with more than two cameras and two lenses. Because, again, I had a second camera as a backup in case something happened in my first. And frankly, it did happen in my first. I had Leica's break more than once. And, you know, thinking to myself, oh, my God, I'm so glad I have this second camera uh, because the first one broke. You know, Dan, it's interesting. I, I, as a young photographer, I didn't have the option of buying a lot of gear, so it kept yeah. things really simple. I had my Rolly, I had my, you know, my Leica. And you had to get to know that camera inside and out. Yeah, it, it wouldn't have occurred it, to me to carry other lenses. It just, I, I had one lens. That was it. I had. I was fortunate when I first started. Um, I was a, also a competitive uh, shotgun shooter. My father was a competitive shooter, and learned we something were, about you every day, Dan. I can't believe it. Yeah. So I'm I'm out like shooting international skeet and trap and sporting clays and all these things. And a, and a guy that was hanging around uh, that was also a competitive shooter, what happened to be a former Dallas Times Herald photographer who was one of the people that was there when Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald. Whoa. And we were out on the range one day shooting and he said, you know, I used to be a photographer and I've got a whole bag of equipment I'm never going to use again. And if you're getting started in photography, let me loan this stuff to you. So he handed me this old donkey bag and it had two Nikon FE, FE twos and a 35 and a 50 millimeter lens. And I remember as I reached out to grab the bag, I grabbed the handle, the, the strap of this old donkey and he didn't let go of the bag. He held onto it and he goes, he said one thing, and I'll never forget this. He goes, don't stand in the North 40 and shoot something in the South 40. <laughs> and, that, and that is a country, American country way of saying, move your body and get close to what you're photographing. Don't, don't stand all the way over yeah. there. Shoot something all the way over here. You got to get with, Zoom with your feet. So I had this really amazing intro to having two legitimate cameras and lenses. And then I had to give that stuff back and I bought like this horrible camera for some reason. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, and, and the great thing about cameras like that, and I still feel the same way about like my Leica M4 and my Hasselblad is the more good work you make with a camera, the more endearing that camera becomes to you. Yeah. It becomes it becomes more than a little machine. It becomes like a part, an extension of your your feeling. And you think to yourself, you know, when you're holding it and using it, you have this really great feeling of, hey, this is wonderful. Now, frankly, the only thing I have of modern equipment that remotely feels that way is this old Fuji XT2 because I've used it so much and it feels normal and natural to me. You know, the X-T4, I haven't had long enough, you know, and, and what I make with it is is commercial. It's not personal. So I don't have a, a an emotional attachment to the X-T4. I have much more of an emotional attachment to the X-T2, which is probably like counterintuitive to what people think is you get, oh, you get a new camera. And I'm like, 
it's it's still too new. I don't have a relationship with that camera yet, even though I use it every day. I don't have any emotional attachment to the XT4. Yeah, I have much more of an emotional attachment to the two. You know, that's a big point. It's like you you really do become friends with your camera. You bond with it, and that, that's that's that magical point where it becomes an intuitive instrument for creativity rather than a a box of, of, it's of a, stuff. It's, it's a conduit. You know, it's, yeah, a, it's conduit a conduit to when you get wrapped up in photography, it can completely overwhelm your life, right? We all get, we get addicted to it. We think about it at all times. We drive all our friends and family crazy. We're fixated on it because the camera just becomes a conduit to what you have floating around in your head and yeah. your heart. And when you have something new and something else new and something else new, it's it's why, you know, I hear people raving about the iPhone 12 and I have an iPhone 12. I could care less about my iPhone 12. It is just a, a piece of metal and glass. And yes, I use it every day and it's in it. And I do email and texting and all that stuff. And I occasionally use it to make a photo. I have no emotional attachment to that device at all, because guess what? Less than a year from now, I'm going to have an iPhone 13. That's and right. I'll have a 14 and a 15. And it just is, you know, I, it's not the same thing. Whereas I was at Machu Picchu with my Hasselblad. And I think I've been up the up the mountain at Machu Picchu. I think I've been up there seven times. And I dropped my Hasselblad down the steps, the stairs, the old oh. stone steps at Machu Picchu. Bang, 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 oh. bang. I picked it up. I was like, it's fine. And it just kept working. And I just remember thinking, yeah, you know, that's a that's a Hasselblad. That's yeah. why I like it. And, uh, you know, and I dusted it off and I checked the finder and I was like, OK, look, I think it's fine. Kept using it. I'm like, that's a camera that I love. Yeah. I hear you. Well, Dan, let's take up a few questions. I see a, a few coming in here. Uh, one was uh, here we go. You want me to pick out some? Yeah, pick out a few. There, go Jared. For it. Um, I was thinking here was a good one. Uh, it was uh, from uh, Baggeran, which I believe is John. Um, and he was asking about uh, what inspired you to do double exposures in Albania for that particular oh, that's project. A, that's a great question. And oh, by the way, if that was John who asked that question, um, I did a film yesterday about Albania that I, I am sending to um, Elena Dorfman, who is my co-instructor. She has a website called Wide Angle Photo Tours, which is her Albania workshop series. And I did a little film about why I was doing double exposures. And the double exposures to me came, the idea came from researching Albania. And Albania, for those of you who don't know, um, and the reason I'm saying this, and I mentioned this in the film, as an American, when I started telling people I was going to Albania, I got questions like, why do you want to go to Russia and where in South America is Albania? <laughs> Get okay, out so your people, geography book. Yeah, they had no, no clue, which I thought was hilarious. And when you research Albania and you understand that it's the only country on earth that has had a, a, an existence that's like Albania really is North Korea in terms of isolation. So you had a 50 year period of total isolation with both Chinese and Russian oversight. And what I thought was there has to be remnants of this isolation, but now Albania is a democratic country that's exploding into the world market. And it's, you know, it's exploding into the, the Balkan market. And I was like, this, how interesting would it be to shoot one exposure with the idea of old Albania in mind and a, and a new exposure with the idea of the new democratic Albania? So one of the one of the images, for example, is of four or five tourists who are swimming in Lake Shkodra. And the, the first exposure is of the lake and this mountain range that runs along the lake. And then the second exposure were the tourists getting into the water. And to me, if you know the history of Lake Shkodra in the history of Albania and what happened if you were caught swimming in that lake during the isolation or heading towards Macedonia or one of these places, it was, it was a big deal. And so now we've got we've come to the point where people like me can just show up at Lake Skodra and go swimming. And it's absolutely gorgeous. It's the most it's one of just a really magical, beautiful lake. But it also has this prior history of that wasn't so beautiful. And so that was the idea. Um, and the second part of this answer is that I had an idea in my head of how I wanted to do the double exposures. But in the first morning of the first day, 
I realized my technique was wrong that I hadn't, I realized I, I couldn't do what I thought I was going to do. So I had to morph my idea of what a double exposure was. My original idea was to do basically two of the same image, but just slightly off. Mm -hmm. And I realized immediately that that was not a good idea. It was terrible. It just looked like out of focus images. And yeah. so I was like, wait a second, I have to, and here's the cool part about what this made me do. And another reason why I couldn't change equipment is I had to make one exposure and then the camera says, what do you want to do? Do you want to do a second exposure or do you want to move on? So, and I would hit, I want to do a second exposure. I couldn't use the camera until I decided what that next exposure was. And what I realized was I needed two entirely separate subject matters to make it work. So there were times where I hit, I want to make a second exposure and then spent four hours before I found my next picture. Interesting. And so it was very slow and very challenging. And I probably ended up with about 10 or 12 images total that I think are really successful. And then some like B, B level stuff and plenty of C and D level stuff. And then I also tried to shoot standalone straight images that were good enough to stand alone so that I could mix so that the whole magazine was not just double exposures. It was very strong standard images mixed with double exposures. And that even made it more difficult because there were times where I had the first exposure done, but then I saw a standalone moment that I wanted and I had to discard that first exposure and start over and just do a straight image. And then I do a straight image and then I would flip the dial on the camera and go back to doing double exposures. So I've never worked that way before and it was a lot of fun, but it was really hard. I hear you. Okay, we got another one here from Manny. I saw you have an M4. How do you choose to use film or digital? Oh, man. You know, Manny, that's a, it's a good question. Um, at this point in my life, because I have so many responsibilities and I'm not working as a photographer, I work full-time for Blurb. And I'm, I have a YouTube channel. I'm doing social for Blurb. I'm doing content for Blurb. I'm doing... Um, stuff for a variety of different people and it's almost impossible to, for me to use film on a day-to-day -day basis plus where I live in New Mexico logistically it means that I need to put my I need to FedEx my film to somewhere like Los Angeles yeah get it processed get it scanned and have it FedEx and it's an incredibly like slow and wasteful process so I'm primarily using digital now but I am having dreams of doing something, doing a long-term project in the future where I leave everything digital at home and I take my, my Leica and a 50 mil and a bag of film and my audio recorder and I go to some place like Peru or somewhere in Latin America and I just work and do nothing but film and sound. Um, that's, that, that is sort of something I'm contemplating doing now that could happen in the next few years. I have a ton of film stockpiled. I have the cameras. Um, I would come up with a specific story idea so that I could just, <clears throat> I could just drill down on that story. There, there is a story in Peru that I've been, I've been eyeing for a long time that would take me way, way, way up in altitude, um, uh, and focus on a specific group of people who live at high altitude. And, um, and I would shoot that with film and, and record sound. Cool. Here's one from Alias Wave. Um, I'm taking a 3,000 mile trip across the Rockies. I'll just stick this on here. There we go. Across the Rockies yeah. National Park. Probably won't be able to get out during the ideal light because I'm taking my brother who's fighting cancer. Sorry to hear that. Any tips for harsh daylight? That, well, number one, um, I applaud you for taking your brother out. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a great thing to do. Cancer sucks no matter how, how you look at it. I hope that things work out well. And I think being in nature has proven to be a, um, a health for the body. Absolutely. Just being in nature provides um, a health benefits. So I'm glad you're doing that. So I have a couple of ideas for harsh light. Uh, one is to think about shooting backlit, which means shooting into the sun whenever possible, not with the sun behind you. So instead of having the sun over your shoulder, turn around and shoot into the sun so that whatever you're shooting has a little rim of light around it. Could be a mountain range, could be your brother. Um, the second thing is to forget about the shadow and just expose for the highlight and just let the shadows go completely black. 
And that way you have these dramatic, very abstract looking images where the only thing that you can see in the frame are the, are the hottest parts of the image. That could be the branches of a tree, that could be a ridge line, you know, it could be the light around the face of your brother and then everything else just goes black. Um, and with digital, if you're shooting digital, you can always, you always have the option of, if you're shooting raw files anyway, you have the option of going back in and sort of opening all that stuff up. Yeah. But that's, that's a little trick that you can use in, in harsh light. Absolutely. Here's another one. We love it when we get together too, right? So Dan, when you talk about the three ingredients, light, time, and composition is form, formation, another ingredient. I would put form and formation in composition. Yeah. I think that those are, those are other words for, for composition is just how you see the world. And, um, you know, if you look in composition is one of those things that, you know, I can't tell you what your composition is and I can't tell you how to do it. It just comes from years and practice, you know, and I think about certain photographers out there, Alex Webb, for example, when it comes to color, photography, Alex Webb has a very distinctive look. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, Salgado has a look, uh, every, every, all these photographers have a certain set of ingredients that they tend to go back to over and over again. And that is because that is how they see the world when they're standing there waiting and they're watching the, the, the world in front of them and they're waiting for the pieces to move together. They are looking for something that feels right that looks right because they've seen it and they've felt it before. You know, if you look at Alex Webb and you take work that he's done all over Latin America, there is a consistency to it. There's a consistency to the, not only the camera equipment, but the, the, and the film he's using, but there's a consistency to the light and the compositions. And that's what makes Alex Webb, Alex Webb. That's what makes it realistic for me to see an image in a museum and go, that's an Alex Webb. Or, you know, that's and that's what we're all after is for people to be able to identify your work without having to read your name on the on the caption. You look at it and you go, I know who did that. Yeah. Good one. This isn't a question. It's a comment that I thought you'd like to see, Dan. <clears throat> From, all right. Here we go. Yeah. Pando nice. times. I like that. I haven't I haven't heard that before, but um just finished and printed my fourth board book in plain sight. Thanks to Dan for the indirect uh, encouragement during Pando times. Look, anyone who went out and was resourceful and constructive during this time is needs to needs to be acknowledged, right? If, whoever, however, we contribute in our own way. You could have been a frontline worker who's giving vaccines. You could have been a photographer who said, look, I know I can't travel, but I'm going to document my neighborhood or my apartment building or something, you know, and did it safely and was constructive. I tried to learn filmmaking during the pandemic. I should have I should have done more. I should have done Spanish and guitar, uh, but I didn't. I, you know, I did a lot of running and cycling and hiking and snowshoeing and all that stuff, too. So I'm, I'm very active, but I, I, I kind of feel like I did about 60% of what I could have during the pandemic. So I'm glad that you were making books. I made a few myself. As Absolutely. Well. well, Dan, we're going to let you get back to work. Is there any final thing you'd like to leave these guys with to up their game? You know, just, um, I think one thing that kind of gets, kind of gets lost sometimes if you're, if you're somebody who's very focused on photography and adamant about photography and getting better, Sometimes we have to take our foot off the gas from time to time, and we just have to appreciate the fact that we have the ability to do this stuff, that we have the ability to talk about photography, come on YouTube, spend our time, you know, get new equipment, and go out and practice something that you know, a lot of people in the world just don't really care about. And so I think it's nice, it, the idea that this should be entertaining, fun, um, is, shouldn't get lost in the shuffle. It should be, you know, keep things in perspective and when you do something well, you know, take the time to acknowledge it. But when you don't, that's fine, too. And, you know, again, we're like baseball players. Most of the time we're going to we're going to either get thrown out or hit a pop fly or hit a liner or strike out. You know, if you hit 300 in baseball, you're a genius. And photography is kind of the same way. Boom. Thank you, Dan. We love having you on the show. We'll have you back again soon. And uh, have fun in that van. Absolutely. We'll talk to you guys later. Thanks, Jared. And thanks to everybody who, uh, who signed in. Uh, great, great talking with everyone. Awesome.
Adios. Once again, amigo, thanks a, thanks a lot. Stick around, yeah. you guys. We got a few more pieces of news here. So um, we're going to give away uh, two weeks. We I, we didn't announce that, but I'm just thinking we should do that. Two weeks free membership to uh, AYP Plus. You guys can come on board. I've got some cool classes I'm working on. We're going to do some work on personal development this month in April. It's springtime. It's the rebirth, you know. This is a good time to take a look at ourselves as people behind the lens. Behind that camera is you. And the more you work on yourself and your frame of mind, the better photographer you're going to be. So we're going to actually be exploring that pretty heavily in this coming month. Um, so we'll do that in a second. But a couple of pieces of news. So Jared and I just finished this full course I mean come on this was a big deal the entire book advancing your photography we've turned into a video class from me we had an earlier version which was narrated well it was good but this is me giving you that class and that was uploaded last night right Jared just finished yep it's just finished we, we just have a couple of uh, things to quickly finish up after we're done with the call and then we're launching it today awesome so you guys can get it we're going to give a discount this weekend easter weekend um i don't know if you have a link for that jared you can stick in there but you guys should grab this course listen this is a good course <laughs> i've got to tell you it's not only the book but it's all the other things i've learned since i wrote it in 2016 which is a lot and i've added those components in there but this is a complete course in photography no matter what level you are you can advance to the next level that's why we call it advancing your photography it's about you um another item so if we have a link jared maybe i don't know if we do so uh, i'll just say this we don't have a link right now we'll get it out to what i will be putting into the chat is a way for you to sign up for our newsletter Okay, uh, and we'll be sending it out to the newsletter people information about the sale and the new course coming out. So Good idea. Join check that link out. Yeah, join our newsletter. You'll get our news. Um, we're also uh, we are going to create a little course. We're going to try it out. It's not really a course, more like a webinar series uh, that will be a, a chat with me once a week. We're going to chat. We're going to try it out. This will be on a Zoom call, not YouTube. Um, we have to pick the right day because we have other classes. I'm thinking at this point it might be Thursday after we go live because on Thursday we're going to be live doing live interviews. Next week we have the great photographer Huntington Witherall, who I've done a number of interviews with. So he'll be on next Thursday at 10 a.m. And I'm thinking... Shortly after that, we'll do this uh, live chat. And basically what I'm going to do is give you like maybe 10 or 15 minutes of something, whatever, that week I've kind of come across. And then we'll just open it up for hear from you, your questions, concerns, challenges, whatever it is. We're going to try that out a couple of times and see how that goes. Um, I think that's it as far as the news. We also are uploading a series of little short clips from uh, the course, those are going to be on Instagram TV, and I think we'll probably start with those today. So we got a lot of stuff happening here, okay? And so, uh, make sure that you're subscribed for sure so that you always get that We stuff. don't want to forget that. Make sure you're subscribed, you enable the bell, okay? So definitely get in there and do that. And I think that's about it. I love seeing you guys here from all over the world. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe, stay well, stay creative, and say this with me, okay? Wherever you are, I really want oh, you to... Oh, wait. S yeah. We have one quick thing that we have to do. Oh, it's we have to give away. Giving That's away. right. Uh, Thank you. So I, had to, I did some quick stuff, and our winner is uh, Kay uh, Tanaka, uh, oh, who Kay is the Kana. person that completed that blurb book. So congratulations. Um, if you could email me, uh, and I'll put in the chat but if you can email me i'll get you hooked up with uh two free weeks beautiful and the rest of you guys make sure you do sign up for our newsletter if you aren't already 
because that's where you will be able to get the information about when this weekly chat is with me. Okay. All right. And if I haven't already told you this, subscribe, enable the bell. D definitely take advantage of that because we've got a lot of new shows coming up. And finally, last but not least, say this with me. Okay. Remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Stay safe, you guys. Love you, and we'll see you next week, if not sooner.